Welcome to a special interview. I'm Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House here with author Roger Thomas. Hi, Roger. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. Excellent. So we had a very fun interview uh, on your novel Under the Watchful Sky last time. Uh, today we're going to be talking about your other published novel, uh, or novel published by Tumblr House, From Afar. From Afar. Um, yep. What's From Afar about, Roger? Well, From Afar is a long-held dream of mine to write a novel of the story of the Magi from, from uh, St. Matthew's Gospel. Um, we know the account in Scripture. It's very brief. Uh, there's been a lot of legend embellished around it, in, including the number of the uh, Magi, their, even their names, um, the camels. You know, that's not part of the original story. <laughs> uh, actually, in, in Europe, the Magi are a much bigger thing. Um, than, than they are here. In Europe, um, for instance, in, uh, in Spain and such, you don't get visited by Santa Claus. You get visited by the three kings. They're the ones who bring the gifts. So they loom large in legend, but there's not a whole lot of detail about them, and that, it will always be that way. But it gives a writer's imagination scope so you can fill in some details and, uh, and have some fun. And I, there were other reasons I wrote that one as well, but but that's the uh, that's the framework. Okay, yeah. So this book is, I guess, you could consider it historical fiction. Yes. Um, now this this is this has been a genre that I've always been very leery of. Um, I'm because I'm really sensitive on it because it feels like there's license to diverge uh, significantly from historical accounts. Like there's no responsibility like people don't judge it based on its historical accuracy um i know i mean there's a lot of movies out there i won't watch a bunch of movies because i know they engage in a sort of historical revisionism and i just i can't stomach that um what's your approach to historical fiction well i mean you're you're very wise to be leery because there is a lot of that going on a lot of people think well i can tell this story i can give you a picture of this history better than the original people do. Yeah. Um, my, my approach, when, if I'm writing history, for one thing, I want to make it to be very true to what is known about the events. Um, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of what Lewis called chronological snobbery kicking around the, in the modern times. The idea that everybody before us was just too stupid and they didn't know anything. And therefore, we, have, we enlightened ones have to come along and set the record straight. Well, that's just folly. You know, people of old times knew how to write history. They didn't always write it the way we moderns like our history. You know, we like nice chronological uh, <laughs> sequence with all the details filled in. But that's a modern affectation. A lot of ancient writers would not write like that, but that did not mean they were not writing historical accurate, historically accurate details. Mm. Um, so when I'm writing historical pr fiction, particularly if I'm touching on the scriptures, it's extremely important to me to stay true to as many details as are known. Um, now, with the story of the Magi, that's a tough one because there just aren't a whole lot of details. But the the what details we have in Matthew's Gospel and how they dovetail with other aspects of the salvation story are very important to keep straight. So that was job one with that book, was making sure that I had the details filled out in such a way that they respected and reflected the scriptural account, such as it is. But there's another aspect, even more so than the question of actually revising the events of history. And that is that one of the challenges to writing accurate historical fiction is to try and convey the ways of thinking of the people of that time. Um, there's, there's a fair amount of scriptural fiction, particularly in evangelical circles, uh, that often tends up kind of being disappointing because even if the person's a good storyteller, they can't break free of the mindset of the time they live in. They're postmodern Westerners and they think like postmodern Westerners mm. and the right story about David and Goliath or whatever it might be. They just project postmodern Western thought back into that time. And it takes a bit of, of work to realize that people of different times and places thought differently and they looked at the world differently than we do. Um, I remember taking a course in Shakespeare in college, and the the instructor had one of the first books he had us read was a little thin volume called The Elizabethan, Elizabethan Worldview. 
which was a brief primer in how Elizabethan people thought. Um, you know, the uh, various heliocentric or um, to, um, earth centered universe, the spheres of heaven, all that uh, kind of yeah. thing. And so, in order to understand Shakespeare properly, our instructor, I think, wisely thought you need to learn how Shakespearean thought. So, casting back to the Magi, and well, it's more that that period of time, that was the Hellenistic period. That was a period after the Greeks had risen up and conquered pretty much all the East. They conquered the Persians. This is Alexander the Great. They conquered Egypt. They conquered the Holy Land. They conquered Persia all the way out to the edge of India where they finally stopped. And the culture that followed was called the Hellenistic culture and actually endured through well into Roman times. In fact, the Roman culture, it's called Greco-Roman for a reason. Mm. The Romans were the military people, but by and large, they adopted the Greek Hellenistic culture. And that was a that was a period. I've got thick volumes on my shelf about the Hellenistic period and how they thought. It's important to know that period because that's when the incarnation happened. That's when Jesus came. It was right in the middle of the Hellenistic period, and a lot of the struggles in the New Testament, and especially when you get into like Paul's travels, are him working in the Hellenistic world, and that. That was one place I saw a real opportunity to go beyond just conveying an interesting story about the Magi. It, because the Hellenistic world of the first century AD was is very much like our world, or to put it another way, our world is very much like theirs. In this sense, it's a very anthropocentric. It's centered on man, not God. Mm. Centered on the works of men, the words of men, the deeds of men. Um, Back in those times, they were very religious, but the gods were minor characters. They were inscrutable. You couldn't understand them. They were capricious. Um, and, you know, truth be told, it was more important what the Romans were doing than what the gods were doing. Um, it, it was a world very much centered around the works of, of, of human beings. And in our day, we're in a very similar kind of way. The, God has been dismissed. People worship many gods, if you want to think of it, that they worship the works of their hands, you know, their careers, um, their political parties, their ideologies, whatever it might be. And the, the one true God has been kind of shoved to the side as being irrelevant. And so that was the framework from which I approached the story of the Magi, that these would have been men of their time, and they would have had these attitudes and they would have been looking for truth um, in different ways. And so the, those were the, the big questions driving the story of from afar. How can I bring these people to life and convey why were they looking for the king of the Jews? What was so important to them? And what did they actually find? Ooh, okay, this is a tough interview because after what you just said, my mind is pulled in 50 different directions because there's so <laughs> much to talk. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll give shorter answers. Okay. No, I mean, that was great. That was great. I just, I hope I could keep every direction in my mind because I want to touch on so many different things from what you just said. Um, now, yeah, you talked about like the worldview and one of my favorite <laughs> things um, in the book, because so the three magi, if I remember correctly, they're from somewhere in Persia, right? Um, well, they, they're originally, I, I kind of hewed a little bit to the custom here because in, in Catholic tradition, they come from three different areas. Um, what Persia, one of them, uh, that would be Malchior. Balthazar comes from Arabia. And Gaspar is a, an interesting one because in some traditions, he comes actually from India. Other traditions, he comes from the area of Armenia, ah. um, the Caucasus Mountains. And so I chose to have him be from, from India. But they do meet in Persia because the way the story goes, um, Melchior kept a school and the other two were students at that school through the years. And so they meet there together. And that's where the story begins. Mm. Yes. So, um, so yes, yeah, so they're, they're not Jewish. They're not Christian. They're, you have this different, interesting perspective on the world. And right. your, your research sort of came across in, ter in terms of their worldview because, you know, when they're thinking about the Jews, they're elucidating on the Jews, you know, they, 
Jewish beliefs are pretty normal to us, you know, the, but to the Persians, right. it's very different because, as you said, as you alluded to, the monotheistic, uh, or not mono, excuse me, uh, you know, how, how every other culture treated gods, it was on the works of men, and God, you know, yep. their gods weren't really involved, whereas the Jewish people had sort of a personal god. And yep, it was yep. it, it was an entirely alien culture to them. They, they were very tight knit compared to everyone else, and so you know there was a lot of idiosyncrasies that the Jewish people had, which the rest of the world didn't have at that time. And it really came out through um, the Magi's perspective. I thought that was very interesting. Right. Well, that was that was one of the driving questions that caused me to write the story was why would these pagans care about the king of the Jews? Yeah. Um, you know, because the Jews were at the, looking down the line of salvation history, I mean we stand here as Judeo Christians, we can see how important the Jews were. As Jesus himself said, salvation comes from the Jews. Yeah. They're they're essential. But looking from a worldly perspective, uh, the perspective of you know power politics or or big empires of that time or this the Jews would have seen a very minor people, you know, scattered and diminished. Right. They had no king. Who cares? I mean, it's just like being, like, caring about who's the mayor of Thousand Oaks or something like that. You know, it's like, you know, what? But who would care? Why would Why would it matter to them? And so that was one of the driving questions I had to answer because if these magi got on the road for this lengthy journey. Um, something had to drive them, and why would they come? Why would pagans come seeking the king of the Jews? Mm. Why would they even care? Why would it matter? I mean, go to the temple of Zeus in Rome, go to the temple of Diana in Ephesus, but the king of the Jews? <laughs> what, what difference does that make? So that was a question I tried to address in the story, and come up with a reasonable rationale for why it became so important for them to seek the king of the Jews. So, well, you know, a layman, you know, I'll just represent the layman's version. They'll say, well, a star guide them. They're just following a star. They're astronomers, right? So they saw some something in the sky and they're like, okay, let's let's go over here. Is that is that how it, it goes in the book? Well, it, it, um, something like that. They see something in the heavens. And again, I draw some research. I, I note this in the uh, notes at the beginning of the book, there was a, a an amateur astronomer by, astronomer by the name of Rick Larson who did some very interesting research with star mapping software that you can, they have these days, and you can run it on your computer and you can put yourself anywhere on the face of the earth, anywhere in time, and see what the stars look like overhead. And he did some compelling research. And if you go to, there's a website, Bethlehemstar.com, and you can get a, a, a video for $10, which is very interesting. And he explains all his research. And he explains what the heavens would have been doing. And it makes a compelling case. It, and nobody really knows, of course. But he makes a compelling case. And I drew on that, but that's only a starting point. Because astrologers looking at the heavens and saying, oh, there's interesting stuff going on up there. It still doesn't answer why they would have gotten on their mounts and rode 700 miles to get right. to Jerusalem. Yeah, that how far they went. Um, other other scholars who've done more scholarly research into this say, well, it really wasn't from Persia, and it really wasn't all that far, and all that kind of thing. We can talk about that later. But given the framework of the story that I'm writing, what would have impelled them to make that journey? It would have been more than just seeing astrological phenomenon. There would have been more to it. And here um, I draw on the fact that. The prophet Daniel, the great prophet Daniel of the Bible, mm. what he lived his life in Babylon and Persia. He, in fact, died in Persia. And he was given many, he was one of the few Jewish prophets that were given prophecies and visions that went beyond the immediate interests of the Israelites. His visions, if you read his book, they're very apocalyptic, they're very strange, highly symbolic, hard to understand. But they entail pagan nations prophecies about the rise and fall of empires. And that all happened in Persia. Mm. Or in so that's what I that's what I draw upon to tie that together. It's like more than just the stars in the heavens. 
these scholars also study the works of the prophet Daniel or Balthasar. Yes, he would have been known in the East. Mm. And Works. And those things together convince them that something momentous is happening, and they need to go investigate. I see. Okay. Um, so it seems like you've done a lot of. I mean, you're so well read. Um, was you know? So it seems like you might have perhaps come across some of this research naturally. Was there anything? Before writing the book where you said to yourself, okay, I need to research this specifically and I need to get this hashed out. There, there were a lot of things that I, I, I touched up on. I, I went back and researched. Of course, I kept the, the scriptures right nearby mm. to make sure I was re, you know, reflecting the story such as it is um, accurately and accounting for little details like it's been, a, it's been a mystery to many why there seems to be a contradiction between St. Luke's account and St. Matthew's account about um, the, the, uh, the fact that St. Matthew records the flight to Egypt and St. Luke never does. Mm. He just, you know, in the second chapter is the nativity and it's the visit of the, Ma no, the, the Magi don't even visit in Luke's gospel. They just go to the temple for the purification and then go back to Nazareth. Only St. Matthew records the fact that, well, there was this little detour down to Egypt in there. And again, this is how one difference between historical writers of, of other times and our times, we like our history in nice, tidy, sequential packages. Um, if, you know, we'd want to reconcile that, go, okay, what's going on here? What did, you know, did they go straight back to Nazareth or did they go to Egypt or what's the story? We'd want that all straightened out. Ancient historical writers didn't care so much about that as long as they got the relevant facts in there. Mm. And Saint you know, the Holy Spirit was leading Saint Matthew to write things that were relevant to his account, and Saint Luke to write things that were relevant to his. So um, I kept those close. I studied um, ancient Near Eastern cultures, particularly filling in details to try and give some accuracy to like the pagan temples and their practices and things like that, because you know. We may think of religion as being something pristine and, and holy and moral, but you learn a little bit about those pagan cultures and some of the things that went on in those temples, and that was pretty brutal. It was pretty, pretty ugly stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay um, so, you know, aside from the, you know, so one of the other considerations, uh, particularly uh, with this, you know, kind of as a part of uh, historical fiction, like we don't want, you know, some people might be sensitive where it's like, well, I don't want you to impose your image of the nativity story on mine. I have my own image of the nativity story. What would you say to that? Well, w what you're getting there basically is the imposition of a romantic and sentimental um, idea over the, the plain fact that this was a historical event. Mm. The nativity was a historical event. Everything around it was a historical event. You know, the birth of St. John the Baptist, the visitation, the flight to Egypt, all these things actually happened. And unfortunately, we've kind of, and this is true of the Magi too, we've kind of wrapped them in this kind of sentimental cocoon hmm. that makes us feel comfortable. And we like it, um, but it's not, that's not the purpose. The purpose of the historical accounts is to convey the centrality of the incarnation. God became man, mm. and he came into our midst. And, you know, it, it may surprise a lot of people, but for much of Christian history, Christmas was a minor holiday. It, it was celebrated. It was Christ's Mass, and you had Advent leading up, and then you had the festival afterwards. But Easter, Lent, Easter, and the Easter season were far bigger than Christmas is. Um, in, in the Christian calendar. And so, you know, but we get attached to our sentiments and there's nothing wrong with sentiment. I, I like to be sentimental myself. You know, I like certain things, Christmas time, especially sentimental time, but we can't let that interfere with our attempt to understand the real message of, of Christ becoming, you know, coming to our midst right now. I'm reading an excellent book. Um, a friend of mine got it. It's the life of Christ by Bishop Fulton Sheen. Oh, that's on my to read list. That's a famous. One. Oh, excellent. Excellent book. Can't recommend it too highly. And he does a magnificent job 
of driving home the point that, you know, set aside all the sentiments and all the fluffy figures and all that stuff. Christ came to die. Mm. He came to die for us. And that has profound implications. And if we ever get to the point where we're letting our sentiment interfere with our grasping the important thing, like, like Advent, we're in Advent now. The main thing Advent is supposed to do is confront us with the fact that we need a Savior. Mm. You know, we needed God to abandon his, his high position and the second person of the Trinity come down and assume human form. You know, we, we take it for granted. We th I mean, uh, attitude largely these days is like, well, sure, we're such great folk. Why wouldn't God want to come down and hang around with us? Hmm. You know, what else we got better to do? <laughs> and I, I like I like Lewis's uh, C.S. Lewis's comment in um, Mere Christianity. He's trying to convey what it meant for the second person of the Trinity to take on human flesh to become a human. He said, "Imagine becoming a slug." or a crab and you'll get somewhat a dim idea of what it meant for mm. the, you know, the God had to abandon his position. I mean, like it says in, I believe Philippians, <coughs> St. Paul says, though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not deem equality with God, something to be grasped at rather he emptied himself. Mm. And that's something you need to be reminded of the emptying, the humiliation of God, to come and be born. And that's one thing I try and convey in the Magi story, because it's not just about the Magi. I try and convey the entire nativity um, scenario, everything from um, John the Baptist and the Annunciation and all that. But I try and convey it in such a way that people can look at it with new eyes, you know, to kind of set aside the sentimental accretions of the years and actually look at it as it had, had happened, because it was a terribly humiliating thing to not, I mean, St. Mary didn't have a chance to even say where she could have her baby. I mean, you know, every woman has the right to have that. Yeah. It's a basic right of a woman to be able to say, I'd like to have my baby in humane conditions. And nope, Lord didn't allow that. Had to be born in a barn. Mm. Okay, gosh, 50 things to, to jump on there. Okay, first off, <laughs> coincidentally, I'm also reading Fulton Sheen. I'm reading Way to Inner Peace by him. As good okay. as a speaker he is, he is a better writer. I can't believe how good he writes. I, yeah. I, I'm i sort of reading with a pen now and sort of circling all the, <laughs> the quotes that I can post on the internet, and he, he yeah. is jam-packed. Oh my god. Oh, goodness. Sheen was a genius. He he was. It's unbelievable. Um it's one of the most underrated. Uh, more people need yeah. to to just uh, talk about him. Um so there is that. Uh then you talked to, you talked a good bit about sentimentality. That's a perfect segue into um uh, something I wanted to talk about. Um Father Dwight Longenecker had an interesting tweet. He says, I'm coming to the conclusion that sentimentality is the most cloying, suffocating, enslaving aspect of postmodern culture. Sentiments are a fine, normal part of being human, but sentimentality is uh, ty tyrannous. Tyrannous. Tyrannous, excuse me. Yeah. And then I think you say, um, to add on to that, you say, uh, one of the most, or excuse me, one of the biggest deceptions of the romantic illusion is the idea that the more intensely you feel about something, the more true it is. You can feel passionately about a lie. The truth n might not touch your feelings at all. Feelings don't indicate truth. Right. Are you, well, are you against values? <laughs> <laughs> values based on... Um, of feelings and sentiment. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is uh, classic. I mean, you get this um, from C.S. Lewis, who got it from Augustine. Was uh, you know the and he, he addresses this. Lewis does in his book that feelings are not are nothing to base anything on. They come and go, and they come back again. And all the all the great all the great writers, Benedict, all the rest. Um, that is Saint Benedict of the Benedictine Order. Um, Francis and all the rest make this point again and again that we can't allow how we're feeling at the moment to to determine our values, to drive our actions, and and to form our characters. And and that was Father Dwight's point 
what is it? Sentimentality. By sentimentality there, he means being driven by how you're feeling about something. Letting that determine what you do and how you live your life. And, you know, it, it really is crushing because it makes people at the whim of whatever. It makes them easily propagandized, for one thing. Um, there, there's there's very little communicating with people about, you know, well, okay, let's talk, get down to the facts of the situation. What are the details? Oh, no, you know, I just can't bear this. You know, I can't bear to think of this and such situation going on. It's too much for me. Well, what they just did was set aside the rational consideration of what are the actual facts of the case and allow themselves to be driven by how it makes them feel. That sentimentality. And it really is. It's it's a it's a it's a slavery because you're at the whim of whatever happens to drive you at the moment and that means if somebody can figure out how to make you feel certain ways they can goad you they can herd you like sheep just by by making you feel certain ways that's why i don't watch news because i don't either b- because yeah. it manipulates my emotion i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm going to attack this but like watching fox news it's like um you know cuz my family watches that and it's it's it it gets you pissed off pardon my language but yeah. i mean it immediately triggers you it gets you to hate it's like okay yeah. we're, we're going to be hating this these people today and we're going to be hate, hating these idiots look how stupid they are um to me it's a device of force and it manipulates your emotions and it does a lot of terrible things and i don't like yep. it at all i don't like it at all oh. um the media is like that in general yeah uh, it's across the board but but i have and, yeah, yeah. I have to say that it, it is it is an impulse because obviously when you mess when you're able to tap into people's emotions then business goes up so that's always yep. the the trap. Yep. Um. Oh gosh, you touched on so much. Uh, what else was I going to say? Oh yeah, the um. Yeah, I, it kind of scares me the emotion and the sentimentality thing because I you know if history has shown us, I mean anything it's it's that people who are emotional make really bad even catastrophic decisions right um you know i mean like just one instance of it is you know uh after world war one you know and yep. we, we we clamped down on germany and all the german yep. people were really angry and yep. they wanted to, for greatness again and we know the rest of the story um, oh yeah Yep. You know, emotional people don't make good decisions. And so I'm worried about our America in that sense because, I don't know, we're, we're losing touch True. with reality and, and everything's just emotion. Oh, you, yep. don't, uh, you don't want to bring your baby into this life, right? You're going to bring him into all this hardship? I mean, right. you can't yeah. do that to that. Are you going to yeah. really let your grandpa suffer so much? Yep. I mean, he's such a burden and he's just, I mean, quality of life, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just like all these appeals to sentiment. And you can especially see it with the um, assisted suicide push. There's almost no question of like, well, why are we leaving anyway? And what kind of, how would you guard against abuses? It's all sentiment. It's all appeals to sentiment. Just yeah. hurting people. Or... Well, you know, yeah, I, I always... Uh, you know, being a student of business, you know, marketing, it, that's almost the goal of marketing in a sense. It mm-hmm. makes me wonder about the ethics of marketing because the most part, you know, as we as we study, the most powerful marketing is the marketing that taps into your emotions. <laughs> and, I have a funny story about that if you want to hear oh, yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Let's hear it. My philosophy professor in college tells told a funny story about one time he was asked by – the business department to come over and give a brief talk in the business area about logical fallacies. That was one of the early things we covered in our philosophy classes, logical fallacies, yeah. five main logical fallacies. Yeah. And so he had his little, you know, can talk. So he went over there and gave a little presentation one afternoon about five logical fallacies. And just, you know, just like you would in philosophy class. And afterwards he, uh, he, you know, he noticed that even while he was talking, the instructors were in the back of the room talking among themselves, and and they never asked him back. And he later had a chance to to, to question, ask one of them, why wouldn't Jim come back? Well, the truth of the matter is, those five logical fallacies—they're the basis of what we teach them on how to market. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. That's what that actually happened to my philosophy professor. He said these fallacies are the basis for how they teach marketing. Right. So it's like you can't come in there and tell them not to do that because we're teaching them how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I always watch advertisements and, you know, I, I, I love dissecting the real message underneath. And uh, I, yep. I know we're going on a tangent, but this is just uh, some of my interests. And one yep. of the most powerful marketing messages, in my opinion, are the marketing messages by um, companies that are selling alcohol, whether it's beer vodka um and if you notice if you look closely at at all the messages they are all the same they're not actually touting the product at all if you notice they don't say oh, oh we yeah. got the best tasting beer we got this what they do is they put this image in front of you of this fantasy that yep. you want to to be a part of and it's like wow this is a great place and then they put their beer as a part of that as as a little yep. part and yep. the message, if I if I had to put it in a sentence, the message is a single sentence: is if you're not drinking, you're not having fun. Yeah. And yep. this all hit me one time, like about maybe ten years ago, where I was at this party, and you know, it's like, well, you know, I kind of don't feel like drinking, and then I, it hit me. It's like, well, but if you're not drinking, you're not having fun. And then I, at that moment, I realized, oh my goodness, I've been programmed by all these yep. marketing messages. So yep, that's right. You know, again, I mean, that's the power of sentimentality when you tap into people's emotions like that and you don't even know how you how you know, you're being formed, really. Yeah, you're being manipulated. You're being manipulated. Uh so and you put your earlier on on a huge issue which is fear. How much fear is used to herd people and manipulate right. people and and, and you know, divide us one from another. Absolutely, absolutely. It's that's another uh, yeah. There's another one. Um. So, okay. Um. There are a couple other things, and you touched on so much. Uh. Whew, okay. Anyhow. Okay. So we're talking about Longenecker. He had an interesting tweet. He also talked about some other thing. He plugged your book. He's uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. from afar. He says, from afar is expertly written, carefully crafted, and fast moving. I enjoyed the plot points, and, sh and I enjoyed the plot points that showed how the Magi's gifts were attained and linked them with the symbolism of king, priest, and suffering servant. Battle scenes and strategies. Uh, strategy sessions heightened the action of the book, and the final meaning in in Bethlehem was tender, majestic, and moving, just as it should be. I have to agree with all of his sent sentiments, and I have to say personally, again, you know, I've talked about historical fiction and my reservations. I've talked about, you know, worrying about imposition of, you know, uh, uh, this person's, uh, you know, per personal view of the nati nativity scene. Uh, my, my personal opinion of, of From Afar is it's going to heighten your appreciation and understanding of the nativity story. I got teary at the end. I, I you know, I'm a man, but I, I'm, I'm not afraid to say that. I, it's, it's, it's funny because there's so much action in the whole thing, and then it's when things calm down that yeah. is the climactic moment, and it's really, uh, I get, I'm getting choked up already just thinking about it. But um, okay. But I must admit that was the biggest challenge of the book, was how to convey. The meeting of the Holy Family, without getting you know kind of cloying and sentimental, but realizing this would be a powerful moment. Yeah, you know the the Magi, whoever they were, wherever they came from, ultimately came because God called them, and they've been recognized throughout history as the first acknowledgement by the Gentiles, mm -hmm. by the nations, of the true King. So they had the first step at it, and yeah, I write adventure stories and. You know, they're the battles and the assassinations and the intrigue and all that kind of thing. Um, and, but I, again, I tried to portray that, portray that realistically, reflective of the times. But the really touchy point was getting to the Holy Family. How do you convey the Holy Family in their humanity? Because we can fall into two errors. We can either make them just, you know, so so sugary that they don't even their feet don't even touch the ground. You know, and they're they're not real people. They're just these paintings on the wall or whatever. 
Yeah. Or you can you can go the other way and just discard the fact that this is the Holy Family we're talking about. Just say they're just ordinary Joes, you know. Well, they weren't ordinary. They were special. The Blessed Mother was special. St. Joseph was special. Yeah. Even, you know, Elizabeth and, and Zechariah, they were all special. And they had a special point in salvation history. But nonetheless, they were human. They, you know, they, they actually did. Their feet did touch the ground. They had to wash their clothes and cook dinner and all the other things that people always do. Yeah. To convey that, the humanity, but at the same time, the pivotal point in history. You know, these, these the Magi were at the center. They were standing there at the very center of history where the incarnation. They had a they had a piece of that action, and how to convey it that was the real challenge of that book. Yeah, well, I, I think that that particular scene is is testament to how good of a of a writer you are. To me, you know, because so much of your book is just plot driven. You know, it's very fast paced, page turner type stuff. But then, you know, you're able to slow down, and then you're able to come out with something. I mean, to me, that scene is your masterpiece so far. Uh, to be honest. Well, yeah. Hopefully there'll be more of them. The yeah. uh, <laughs> hopefully yeah. more, yeah. Hopefully yeah. it's just the beginning. Yes. Um so uh okay, um so yeah, we're going to be giving a um we're going to be doing a book giveaway from afar, um uh starting today on Monday and it, it will end on Friday. Um so um we'll give you the link and the de details on how to sign up for the book that giveaway. Um, another book that I'm just going to give a shout out to, Mystery of the Magi by Father Dwight Father... Langenecker. <laughs> um, the guy, yeah, yes. it's a, he's got his own Magi book. Um, That's and right. So we're selling that at TumblrHouse.com. Uh, I hope to do another giveaway. We're going to do, be doing a giveaway a week, a, each, a new book each week now from, from now on. So everyone's going to want to stay up to date. I, I want to give away some, uh, Mystery of the Magi in the upcoming weeks for the Christmas season. Um, so yep. that's, a, book. that's a book worth investigating. Everyone <clears throat> obviously loves Father Dwight. He's one of the most outspoken priests. Uh, and more priests need to be like Father Dwight, to be honest. Um, I think yep. if, if there are more priests like Father Dwight, uh, we wouldn't be in such bad shape. But, um, yep. okay, uh, moving on. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, touched so many things. I feel like I've missed something because you've you've said so many great things that have jogged my mind. I feel like uh, I've missed one or two things, but, uh, well, we have to trudge on. Um, yep. You've now you again you you say some interesting I follow your Twitter and you say some really fascinating uh things and uh, on uh in October you you tweeted out uh, again this isn't related to the book but I just yeah. I wanted to talk about this because it's so fascinating uh so in October you you tweeted out quote maybe I should start a Dewey Rames only movement. <laughs> And I love I, I I love how you just floated that there, and you didn't add anything else. Like you didn't explain why you you didn't explain anything else. You just sort of just floated that there, and that immediately made me like that. It begged so many questions for me. Like what 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 are you talking about? So I was like, okay, I need to put this on our interview because this is okay. a great topic. So, well, that's that would yeah. be it, put people who've had exposure to the kind of evangelical movement. You know, the evangelical world will understand more of that because. In more of the fundamentalist corner, there are people who are King James only um, <laughs> Bible. They 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 KJV only, um, and because they 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 are suspicious about all the the newer translations that have come along, and usually KJV only types are associated with true fundamentalism, a very literalistic interpretation of the Bible, um, and and tend to be kind of rigid. Um, your classical Bible story. And it was in the context of that that I thought, you know, maybe you should start doing rooms only. But it, it, that, that was tongue in cheek. There was very much a joke because the church has always acknowledged that the translations um, of the scriptures should speak to the people reading them. In fact, it was a critical moment in church history when St. Jerome proposed translating the scriptures to Latin. To making what? the Vulgate to Latin. Oh, oh, oh I see. So they, they were originally written in Hebrew and Greek, <clears throat> and the versions that most Christians were reading from were Greek. 
the Old Testament was based on the Septuagint, and the New Testament was written in Greek. Hmm. And so, up until Saint Jerome in the in the fourth century, um, that that was the scriptures where they were all in Greek. And Saint Jerome had this startling proposition of translating the scriptures into Latin. And everybody thought, "Oh, why would you do that? That's the street language." You know, that's the language that the, you know, the, the blacksmiths and the merchants use. Why, why would you do that? You want the scriptures in a scholarly language. Well, this even then reflected a bit of the challenge that, because Koine Greek, which is what St. Paul used, that was the street Greek. He didn't use the scholarly Greek, the Attic Greek. He used street Greek. And, but by the time St. Jerome came around, um, the Greek had been, well, that's the language of the scriptures. And you want to learn scripture, you know, Greek to read the scriptures. Well, St. Jerome made the point, and the church took up the challenge and came down, of the right saying, saying, no, the, the word of God, well, first it's Jesus himself, but the indwelling Holy Spirit in the church guiding the teaching of the word is the true source. It's, it's the, that's where the center lies. It's not in the text itself or the language, but in the church, mm. guided by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, it was legitimate to make a translation of the scriptures from Greek into Latin, because that way it could be understood by more people, because the authority of the scriptures rested not in the text or the language, but in the living church guided by the Holy Spirit. So, and that was the springboard, that was a critical decision that the church made because from there on all the translations have come about, you know, to French, to English, to um, Chinese, all the other translations that unlike the Arabs, you know, the, the Quran stays in Arabic. You will never read a translation of the Quran. Um, there are English versions of them, but even those who, who make English versions are saying, this is just the meaning. This is not the Quran. Because to learn the Quran, you have to learn Arabic, because it was directly transmitted to the Prophet. <coughs> and the um, so to them, the authority lies in the text. And uh, you know, then Muslims have a disjoint because what does the text mean? Well, that's up to each individual Muslim. Okay, well, so where's your authority? There's no issue there. Hmm. Likewise, your the the Protestants when they split off and said, well, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Um, well, they got a couple of problems there. First off, which scripture, right? Because there are many translations. Mm -hmm. And secondly, who's going to authoritatively interpret this scripture? Who's going who's to make the division about what it means? And that's why you have people in, in particularly fundamentalist circles, usually in America, somewhat in England, I think, who, who say, well, no, um, at least we're going to nail down the version. And the King James Version um, is, you know, that was the one handed down. Uh, didn't St. Paul use that in, Le in Lystra and Derbe? You know, <laughs> it had to have been that. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a bit okay. absurd. But the way to try and nail down and say, no, the, it's, trying, it's trying to place the authority in the text. But of course, that's just kicking the problem aside because somebody's still got to interpret that. And that's where it gets down to the personal interpretation or my pastor's interpretation or this guy on TV, his interpretation, whatever it might be. So the in, in a way, <laughs> I don't hope don't want to sound too controversial saying this, but there's some ways in which by reverting to sola scriptura, um, especially fundamentalist stripes of Protestants, look a lot like Muslims because they're following the same pattern. They're placing the authority in the text and saying, no, it has to be this text. It has to be the King James Version. The New International won't do. The New English won't do. You know, certainly we don't want any of Catholic versions. Um, but the they're trying to place the authority in the text, but it really can't be in the text. Texts don't have authority. That's why the church is always has always denied the Islamic categorization of Christianity as people of the book. Muslims call us people of the book. We say, no, we're not. We're people of the living Holy Spirit. We have a book, which the Lord gave to the church as a gift. We also have the sacraments, 
we also have the indwelling Holy Spirit in each of us. But that's why one reason why it's a bit of a tongue in cheek thing, because there will never be a do do a reams only version um, movement, <laughs> because the church has already said that there is no such thing. Yeah, the do a reams version was a venerable version. It's a tremendous translation. A lot of people don't realize as many of the same translators who worked on the King James Version also worked on the Douay Reims Version. They were published at about the same time. Okay. And it's a it's a venerable translation. It's a good translation. I have one. Um, but it's not like the translation's the critical thing because as language changes, our translation of the scriptures has to change to better reflect the language. Well... Okay, this is interesting. I mean, there are some, I mean, I've heard Mother Angelica say, you know, you know, on some translations, you know, Hail Mary, favored one. Favored uh, one, yeah, yeah. That's not a. That's not too hot. She wasn't too hot on that. <laughs> that's kind of different than saying full of grace. So, that's right. So you're well, saying, there, yeah. The, the, the Toy Reams version um, used the Vulgate quite a bit. Okay, and the important thing to understand about the Vulgate is that it's, it was the Latin translation of the original Greek scriptures, but it was translated by St. Jerome. St. Jerome spoke Greek as a native language. It was a living language in his time, as was Latin. So St. Jerome had an understanding of Greek that modern scholars don't have. Hmm. I mean, I have a brother. Who, who is a doctorate in New Testament studies, and he studied the various languages. And he says the big challenge of a translator these days is that you're picking up, you're trying to figure out what these words mean based on how they were used in other ancient manuscripts. You have to read and infer from those other manuscripts what these words meant and then try and apply them to the scriptures to the degree you can. Yeah. So in a way, it's like modern thinkers reaching across the centuries to pick up manuscripts and try and figure them out. St. Jerome was not in that situation. St. Jerome spoke Greek natively. Yeah. He could take Greek and he could translate it. Yeah. So when it was in the Vulgate translation that that phrase was used, full of grace, I forget the Latin, but if you know the the Ave Maria in Latin, you're going to, yeah. uh, grazia plena, that's what it is. There we go. Ave Maria, grazia plena. And so when St. Jerome looked at the original Greek as a Greek speaker, as somebody who knew the language as a living language, and he said the best way this goes into Latin is gratia plena, yeah. full of grace. I trust St. Jerome more than I trust some modern person trying to interpret what, what the, because even if the Greek might have said highly favored one, well, the, you know, to understand that in the context of like the Jewish line, mm. only the great kings were highly favored. Yeah. Only upon them did the full favor of the Lord rest. That was a very powerful phrase in, in Jew. Nobody, it wasn't used about anybody. Yeah. So the, uh, the point being that the Mother Angelica was right, that the reflection of the scriptures as they passed on through St. Jerome, through the Vulgate, through the Dewey Reims version, was accurate to the original intent of the language in a way that a modern translator struggles to reach right. by looking at this Greek and saying, well, I, I studied this in class. <laughs> okay. I, I did two classes of Greek. I did four classes of Greek. Well, I don't care how many glass, classes of Greek a modern did. Yeah. He's not going to match St. Jerome. You know, I, I I do have that opinion about Saint Jerome and his yeah. place in translating scriptures. Well, that's great. I'm happy because you know I got a little nervous because I didn't know how you know some people. Uh, yeah. So, but you know, I have to admit, with all that being said, I, I have uh, a confession to make, which is that um, I don't always read the Dewey Rames Bible. Um, you know, because <laughs> it's, it's harder to read. It's harder. Reading is hard. You know, maybe yeah. I got into the wrong business as a publisher, but sometimes re <laughs> reading can be hard. No, I, yeah. I mean, some of the words, they say it a little awkwardly, admittedly. Mm -hmm. um, and so going through it, it's harder for me to absorb. So right. I actually do read other versions where it's like it flows better and I feel like I can absorb it. But right. 
but I do actually because I have the Dewey Rames Haydock version. I do go do, read the Dewey Rames Haydock for the commentary because sometimes right. it's like what's going on, and then you'll have you know Saint Augustine and the other pros, uh, yep. you know opine. So yep. yeah, is that how you are? I mean, it, should I feel oh, guilty yeah. for for reading other? No, no, no. The Bible? I I use the Revised Standard. I use the Ignatius Bible myself. Mm, okay. And the you know again we've we got this by the church's authority saying um, it's it's okay to read a readable Bible. That's now you know my preference is to get the most accurate one, which is why I go for the Revised Standard over the New American. Mm. Um, but when I'm doing like deeper study in scripture, I'll actually check several Bibles. Yeah, me too. You know, what What does the Dewey Ream say? What does King James say? Because mm -hmm. it is scholarly edition. Um, what are these? Because there are various versions like the literal translations, which are hard to read. Yes. Uh, a literal translation because a lot of the original language was very clunky. Yeah, exactly. That's a good word. That's a great word. Yeah. That's what I was trying to reach for. Yeah. Yep. And, but, so... But you pay a price. My, again, my brother, the New Testament scholar, said translation is a lot harder effort than a lot of people understand. How do we render this this particular phrase into the language in a way that it communicates to the new readers what the old writing was saying? Right. That's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see here. So I think I think that's pretty much going to do it. Um, okay. So let's see here. Uh you know, but one book I have neglected, plug, Under the Watchful Sky by this man. <laughs> this is, this is, you know, all these people keep calling me up and emailing and saying, you know, when is the next book in the, in the series? And, you know, I keep telling them, you know, next year, next year, you know, hold your horses, you know. Well, all you people who keep <laughs> harassing me relentlessly for this book, why don't you just spend, you know, pass the time with From Afar? It's by the same writer, so chances are you will also like this book because you know the same sort of genius is put into this uh, this book as well. So I highly recommend everyone who's who's read and loves Under the Watchful Sky, same writer for From Afar. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, I do. Oh, I I will update the timeline for the next book in Under the Watchful Sky. I uh, I am shooting for spring. I am shooting for early spring. Uh, for everyone who's who's interested and in, I I mean yeah so uh let's see here um and that's uh oh if you haven't if for everyone watching if you haven't seen the other interview uh yet with Roger uh go check it out it was incredibly fun really fun time don't forget the promotion remember and we're giving it uh, um, we're giving away a free copy of from afar so sign up uh, and we'll reveal it on on Friday and um and yeah that'll do it for now uh thank you for uh, stopping by roger this was another fun one happy to we can do another one sometime soon oh yeah absolutely <laughs>